Good afternoon, everyone. It, this is our um, fourth and final session with Rabbi Larry Kotak on Reform Judaism and the platforms. And it has honestly been surreal um, to go through this with him as two things were unfolding over the last month. The first is that Reform rabbis from North America gathered in Israel, as they do for every eight years at the CCAR, the Central Conference of American Rabbis Conference. And so as we are looking at the past and ultimately getting to the present history of the reform movement and its leadership and the language they use to articulate the longings of the hearts of the reform Jews at different times from the 1800s to the 1930s to the 1970s till today, that right now or last week, including Rabbi Levin, were there um, talking about the future. The second thing, um, which is, I guess, a sad thing in a way, is all that is going on in Israel that reinforces the complexity and the chasm that sometimes exists um, with the Jewish people. And for a movement has certainly, from its beginning till now, moved so close to Israel in such a dear and wonderful way. Um, it is it is painful, um, truly, right now to see, um, you know, all that is happening and the pain that exists in the region. Um, and so just to with Rabbi Kotak's eyes and words and pointed questions to reflect on these things while that's going on is like the best um, thing to be doing right now, I think, is is reflecting on all this. So it's just been a pleasure. I've learned a lot. It's forced me to look um at the Adrian, I grew up with Chaim Stern, who was the reform rabbi, um, was the editor of Gates of Prayer, which was a lot of our prayer books for a lot of our lives. And um, and so, you know, I'm a completely a child of the reform movement. And um, so this has just been fascinating. And I can't thank you enough and all of you for joining us and Rabbi Kotak for leading us. So with no further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Rabbi. Thank you so much. And I so appreciate that lovely introduction and all of your patience in trying to look at these documents in a very different light. Because historically, these were pronouncements and my uncertainty is how far they really went into the rank and file of our movements and how many people within our movement actually were aware of them. The other open question, which I don't have an answer is, how much of the imprint that they hope to have really became activated by the rabbis of our movement in their own individual settings and congregations. One of the things that I've been driving towards is our need to enunciate a accessible and understandable platform for what we mean as reformed Jews in 2023, because as I've said and hinted at, I think there are very few guidelines anymore within our movement to help people understand what is our direction? What do we stand for? You know, there are kind of little filters that show up clearly some of you who have been in our movement for decades, remember the 70s and 80s, which were dominated by a real passionate embrace of social justice. Social action was the core model. But then we moved on to what seemed to be spirituality, whatever that meant. And we've in some ways tried to reclaim that social justice model but I'm not sure that the rest of the challenges, what do we feel about Israel? What do we know about God? Why do we pray? What's the role of individual responsibility versus communal obligation? We haven't really addressed those issues. I share a little story with you before we move on to look at some of the more recent statements of our movement. Years ago, when I arrived at Brith Kodesh in Rochester, which was a congregation that had a very, very powerfully strong history of social justice activism, 
I was invited to come and do a teaching at the Social Justice Committee. And this was a committee that owned 12 houses of respite in the city of Rochester. We had a housing corporation. We kept winning that, uh, I forgot even what the name of that uh, um, prize was from the union. So I decided I would teach Leviticus 19, the passage that talks about social justice, don't put a stumbling block before the blind, don't curse the deaf, don't let the wages of the hired servant remain with you until morning. It's worth going back and always engaging, even when it isn't the weekly Torah portion. And one of my guys, who was an incredibly involved and successful social activist, said to me, without hesitation, well, I never saw this before. I didn't know this was there. And I said, Richard, why do you do this? It's not just out of some commitment to liberalism. It has to be based within a structure of identity that motivates you. So it's really from our texts that we should be gaining the insights of where our direction should be going. So having laid that out, let's take a look at the document, which is called New Perspectives. It's the product of the reform rabbinate from 1999. Thankfully, Jessica is running this today. And there she goes. Is it working or do I have to enable editing? I don't know why. It's not letting me go. Okay, let me do to, it. To the beginning. Um, me, but I'll I can I can resave it and I have it right here. Okay. I can start. Okay. Okay. I'll resave so, the others. Here is a statement of principles. You have to share it still. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I did that again and I don't know where to find the uh here. I'm gonna just give me. Give me one second. There, I got it. I got it. I got it. It's you got there. it? So yeah, I can get there. out of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I want you to read this first paragraph to yourself. On three occasions during the last century and a half, the Reform Rabbinate has adopted comprehensive statements to help guide thought and practice. So 1885, incredibly impressive, the Pittsburgh platform, 15 rabbis. Not 30, not 70, not 300, not 800, 15 developed that. So then in 1937, which Rabbi Mates shared with you, the Columbus platform was put in place. And then in 1976, we looked last week at the centenary perspective. And then we go on to their kind of statement of how we've learned much from our encounters with other cultures. And that reform Judaism is that it has enabled the Jewish people for innovation, preserving tradition, embrace diversity. Okay, all very nice, kind of boilerplate, doesn't mean a whole lot, I don't think. Look at the next one. Uh, are you able? Okay, good. So you've heard stated many, many times that at the core of the way in which most historians and philosophers and theologians approach Judaism, they look upon it as the three pillars, God, Torah, and Israel. You know, in Islam, there are five pillars. In our tradition, it's God, Torah, and Israel. But those are lovely words, and they certainly mean a whole lot to a whole lot of different people. But the ultimate challenge is, how do you define them? What do they mean? At one point, there was an Orthodox rabbi who showed up in Rochester who was on the far right side. And I encountered him at Federation. And I said to him, welcome to town. Are you going to join the board of rabbis, which included members of the Orthodox community? And he looked at me and he says, does everybody at the board of rabbis believe in Torah Messini, which is code word for God handed the Torah directly to Moses on Mount Sinai? as opposed to some form of indirect revelation where the Torah comes to be, and it's a byproduct of both divine and human. But that was his perspective. So what I'm saying about that is different people understand that word differently. The word Israel to the Lubavitch community has to do with the Torah, 
not the political entity of the modern state of Israel because they don't accept the existence of it. They will exploit it in elections, but they don't believe it's real because God didn't bring it into being. Human beings activated the new state of Israel. Okay. Now, as you look at this, you start to see the incredible change in language about the way in which things are presented. Look at the ideas about God. We affirm the reality and oneness of God easily make in our understanding of the divine presence. We affirm that the Jewish people is bound to God by an eternal covenant. We affirm that every human being is created but Selim Elohim in God's image, and therefore every human life is sacred. It's very nice. It's not exactly defining, is it? Look at the next page. We regard with reverence all of God's creations. Thank you. We encounter God's presence in moments of awe. We respond to God daily through public and private prayer, through study, through the performance of other mitzvot, sacred obligations. Now, all of a sudden, we have a kind of defined theological statement. Do you remember if you've ever studied Mishnah? There's a concept in the Mishnah that says, when two people study, God's presence comes into the process. This is really what they're speaking about. That through the performance of mitzvot, sacred obligations, we bring closer that awareness and reality. Now, this is very, very far removed from 1885 when they purposefully, the 15 individuals, separated out ethics and religious obligations. The question that I ask each of you to think about or ponder is, do you get that message in the synagogue? Is it enunciated about how you as an individual buy into the process of obligation in terms of mitzvot commandments, not just good deeds, which is always the great challenge, which is another one of those byproducts of the 1885 process where everybody thinks of a mitzvah as a good deed, as opposed to sacred obligations, which may include those actions, which could be understood as a good deed. We continue to have faith that in spite of the unspeakable evils committed against our people and the suffering endured by others, the partnership and humanity will ultimately prevail. One of the major dilemmas for all religious communities is how does one explain the existence of evil? If God is all powerful and all knowing, then how does evil exist in the world? You know, we live with a sense and embrace of free will, which is a lovely kind of a tenant and a concept. And yet for many, going back in time to the Holocaust, the disabling factor is, why didn't God intervene in the Holocaust? Which somehow means that God is responsible for what took place, as opposed to, in my theology, human beings. Evil comes into the world by human behavior, not because there is some kind of other force in the world, which is personified in some Christianities as the idea of Satan the evil existence of the world. This challenge is what I have been working through about the theology that we embrace as a movement. We are embracing in many ways a biblical theology, which made sense and worked in the pre-modern time when people really didn't have the experience, the awareness, the knowledge, so that Galileo is excommunicated in 15, 
whatever, 26 or something, because he had the audacity to say that the sun rotates around the, the earth. He was excommunicated. Would anybody be excommunicated for that today? But in a world where everything was interconnected to the role of God and the awareness of God, it all made sense. But the idea that there are those within religious communities that will still hold on to that. For example, Billy Graham's son said the reason why Katrina took place in New Orleans was because there's sin in New Orleans and that God used that as a way to teach and punish the sinners. Well, part of what our challenge is when we understand an idea of God in 2023 is to try and figure out where those limits exist. Thanks, go on to the next page, please. So here's Torah. We affirm that Torah is the foundation of Jewish life. We cherish the truths revealed in the Torah, God's ongoing revelation to our people. Judaism has taught that creation is ongoing. And I do believe that there is an ongoing dynamic concept of revelation in the world. Torah as the foundation of Jewish life is not with a small T, it's with the big T. The importance of studying Hebrew. And this kind of comment here is a lovely projection of expectation. Go on to the next paragraph. We are commit, no, no. Yeah, we are committed to the, oh, I'm sorry, go back. We are committed to the ongoing study of the whole array of mitzvot. Well, that's a lovely statement. Is that really active in our congregations? The fulfillment of those that address us as individuals and as a community. I like the intent. I worry about the application. I'm not sure. Years ago, the reform rabbinate put out a book called, uh, oh my gosh, what was the name of it? It was a little blue book about mitzvot. Do you remember, Rabbi, the name of it? No. I, I mean, Danny, is it Danny Siegel? No, it was the, the CCAR published a book on a guide to mitzvot, which was a lovely attempt, but I think the experience of you people who are studying together with me today that you don't even know about it is a good enough example of the fact that it never had an imprint. Let's go on. Next page, thank you. Israel. We are committed to the mitzvah of Ahavat Yisrael, of love for the Jewish people and Klal Yisrael, the entirety of the community. We're responsible, we embrace religious and cultural. We are committed to the state of Israel. Well, I know that your rabbis are deeply committed to the existence of the state of Israel. I am challenged significantly by the ambivalence that's found among many American Jews who are uncomfortable with their perception of the modern state of Israel that happens to live in a really bad neighborhood and has to do things that may be concerning or offensive to American liberal, or perhaps should I say, and I, I don't mean this negatively, but left, move, left leaning Jews. And I'll tell it to you in a story. <clears throat> Years ago in Rochester, a few of my congregants decided they were enamored with the concept of J Street, which was established to be an alternative to um, the normal agency that was representing Israel, uh, APAC. 
APAC actually was founded in Brith Kodesh in Rochester. Rabbi Bernstein was the first president of APAC. APAC as an organization has become more right center or center right than where it used to be. Nonetheless, J Street has its own challenges. And if you follow it, you'll know that for some, J Street is unacceptable because they don't find it to be a real advocate for the state of Israel. Nonetheless, this group in its embryonic stages invited Yael Dayan to come speak to the community. Yael Dayan was a member of Knesset, uh, Moshe Dayan's daughter. She was a firebrand in her younger years. At this point in time, she was um, diminished by physical issues. She had a cane and it appeared from smoking she had emphysema. Nonetheless, the person who introduced her got up and said the following, which I've never forgotten. We are all great supporters of the state of Israel, but we are very worried about Israel, that it's like the Titanic on its way to meet the iceberg. And of course, at that point, I wanted to jump up and throw him out of the building, but I didn't, okay? Yael Dayan got up to speak and said, I'm glad to be here. I, I'm glad to speak on behalf of my country, but the country that you just identified, I don't know what it is. I don't know that Israel. And what that taught me, and I would share with each of you is, at the very core, of even those who are involved with Shalom Akshav, the peace movement in the state of Israel, they are patriots. And one of the challenges that we have in the United States is that individuals who consider themselves to be liberal attempt to take their paradigm of liberalism or conservatism that's founded and defined within American culture and experience and project it on to another society and another culture where it doesn't fit. It just doesn't work. So one of my grave concerns, and I know your rabbi's concerns, is how do we reestablish a realistic, honest commitment to the modern state of Israel, even with things that might, in my, our minds, be challenges or upsetting. Israel can't be passive. Israel has to act. Rabbi Mates referenced what's going on in Israel currently with the Supreme Court challenges. And that's a very significant conversation to have. And I hope that at Bethel, there will be a public forum to try and explain it. Because most people have no real awareness of the way in which the Supreme Court functions in Israel. It has really been our court of last resort for all of the human rights and civil rights issues that we have brought to the court because the Knesset has not acted on our behalf. So that court has become the definer of non-Orthodox rights within the state. There clearly are issues internal to the makeup of the court, just as there are issues regarding the makeup of our U.S. Supreme Court, but it's worth having some level of seminar and conversation regarding it so that people can be informed and understand what the challenge is as opposed to merely the talking points that are on both sides of this argument. Okay, let's go on to the next. Our desire to maintain progressive Judaism in Israel? Absolutely. Look, one of the great things that I mentioned it last week was that we now have Israeli born reform rabbis functioning within the state. We are still a very small percentage of the dynamic of the religious communities. And think about if we were 2 million people or 750,000, how that would make a difference in the political structure of the state. We now have a member of Knesset who is one of our rabbis 
but it's a symbolic position because they're only one of 120. Okay, let's go on. Okay. So in 2004, there was a commentary that was written on that platform we just looked at from 1999. So the onset of the 21st century suggests to the leaders that a new statement of principles would be appropriate. The rise in mixed marriage and the embrace of Jews of patrilineal descent had changed the demographic of the reform movement. We are all aware how the nature of definition has changed. One of the great controversies that's brewing at the present time that's come back into the mindset has to do with Hebrew College in Boston, which is a non-denominationally based rabbinical school and actually a very fine educational institution, has now decided to permit students studying for the rabbinate who are either married to or in relationships with people who aren't Jewish. Some years ago, Rabbi Pankin of blessed memory, when he was head of the Hebrew Union College, the idea came to our seminary and was rejected. There are those who believe that because there are fewer and fewer people choosing to enter to study to be rabbis. There are only 18 students currently in Jerusalem in the first year class to study to be rabbis. That maybe from a sociological point of view, it might be in the interest of recruitment for the Hebrew Union College to also change its statement and concept. It's a challenge of great enormity in terms of continuity, in terms of statement. There was a congregation in Rochester that had been a break off from Brith Kodesh in the 1960s, where it was projected that almost 50% of the members of that congregation were not Jewish. It was the congregation that seemed to have a much higher rate of intermarried couples. Now the challenge is how do you make definitions and decisions without seemingly offending or rejecting individuals? When you think about patrilineal descent, do you remember and understand what that means? In the traditional Jewish historic definition, the child of a Jewish mother or a woman who became Jewish was considered to be Jewish by birth. With the growing demographic of people who were married to someone who wasn't Jewish, there was the following challenge. If Susie Schwartz married Tony Bachigalup, their children, even if they did nothing, never belonged to a synagogue, never had bar bat mitzvah, never were confirmed, never went to Israel, their children automatically were viewed as being Jewish by the dominant definition in Jewish life. Except now it's Tony Schwartz who marries Susan Bondiglio, and they have a host of kids and they join Bethel or Brith Kodesh and they have birth rituals for their children and they bring them to Hebrew school and they take them through bar bat mitzvah and confirmation and they send them to Israel when they're 16. We consider those children through patrilineal descent to be Jewish without formal conversion. Those children are not considered to be Jewish by the conservative or the Orthodox movements, but we accept them as such. Well, it's a lovely thing that we do, but we also have to be honest to tell people, which is something that was always challenging, 
that not everybody would accept those kids as being fully and completely Jewish. Why do we need to talk about this? Because all one needs to do is look around in any reform congregation across the country, and you will see variations of this phenomena. And it has changed the nature of who's in the pew, let alone who's on the mailing list. We also see the changes that have taken place with the role of women, which has been fantastic in terms of the role and the acceptance of women within the rabbinate, the cantorate, and so on. It's changed our realities to very important ways. The idea of gender identity within our movement has also come to be. Now we come to the bottom sentence. More study and observance into our lives and the rejection of many observances by the Pittsburgh platform continued to provoke tensions between reform Jews who agreed with that statement. Shall we go on to the next page? As I just mentioned, patrilineality has increased tensions between reform Jews and those in other movements. We see that in the way in which the established powerful rabbinate in Israel rejects us as being wholly Jewish and kind of identifies us as being Samaritans, some alternative model because of the way in which we accept individuals. And clearly there is an issue <clears throat> about our acceptance. There's even now some challenges that are happening regarding the acceptance of conversions outside the state of Israel within the modern Israeli coalition. Okay, let's go forward. I want you to think about this first sentence. If autonomy was the key word of the centenary perspective, dialogue is the key word of the Pittsburgh principles. Well, Pittsburgh 1885 relied on the language of Hegel, the approaching of the realization of truth, justice among us, and Kant exalting a God idea. The Pittsburgh principle uses the language of dialogue this is at the core of what I've been hoping to bring to each of you. Each of these platforms must reflect the zeitgeist, the way in which people thought and lived in the time that they were created. It doesn't mean we're still there anymore. And I don't think we really are. A lot of what was in the Pittsburgh platform has still impacted modern reform Judaism. And I believe it needs to be rejected because it is no longer necessarily either valid or operational in 2023. Let's go on. Go to the next one if you could. Thank you. That's the end of that slide. Should I go to the other slideshow? Yes, please. Okay. This statement is really trying to encapsulate concepts of change and the necessity for awareness of those changes. It now seems self-evident to most that our tradition should interact with modern culture and that it ought to reflect the contemporary aesthetic. But look what it says. The ethics of universalism implicit in traditional Judaism must be an explicit part of our Jewish duty, and that Jewish obligations begin with the informed will of every individual. Well, I can understand 
the ethics of universalism, but I don't want to forget the necessity of particularism. If we only embrace universalism, we kind of evaporate into generalized culture. You know, I've mentioned to you that Judaism historically had a tension between particularism and universalism. And it was when those were in balance with each other as a creative tension, we were the most productive. When we turned too far in one direction other than the other, we lost our footing and our place. And I think in some ways we need to reassert that in 2023, as opposed to, yes, we are universalists. We believe in universal values, but what about us? Is there a value in being Jewish? What is that value and how does it enunciate itself and who and what we are? Let's go on. This is a very important list of statements. What have we learned? Much has changed. We continue to probe the extraordinary events of the past generation, seeking to understand their meaning. Through its many accomplishments, raised our senses as Jews. The role of Israel in our lives cannot be diminished. As I said to you last week, go and find people who lived in the United States prior to the founding of the refounding of the state of Israel in 1948, and they will tell you about what their lives were like and how much has changed with the current status of the state of Israel. Think about the euphoria of 1967 after the Six Day War in the psyche of American Jews. Compare that to the dilemma that we have in modern perceptions of the state of Israel, as I've referenced. There are people who are embarrassed, who don't wanna consider Israel as important because they don't like what they see happening in terms of the treatment of minorities within the state. Let's go to the next slide. Diversity. There's no doubt diversity has become the uh, rallying cry in every piece of American liberal culture. But at a certain point, diversity isn't always the answer. It's important, but do we diversify ourselves out of existence? by not identifying what is unique and special and important about us remaining within a Jewish ethos and concept. And we have to figure out what does that really mean? You know, I go back to that statement by Zev Chaffetz when he wrote about his 50th year of Aliyah, how he belonged to a reform congregation Pontiac, Michigan, where he said it was the Democratic Party with high holy days. Well, that's not sustainable in 2023. We have to be more than that. Let's go on. So here we go with this idea of God and how they are now rethinking this in 2023, in, excuse me, in 2004. I wonder how much you get in terms of messages when you go to temple about a modern understanding of the idea of God. I think it's critical and important. And it's something that I believe we need to re-engage because as I've said before, and I've experienced in my own rabbinate, that when with this word showed up in prayer, if there were 300 people in the room, I don't think it was unreasonable to assume there were 250 different ways of understanding that. And maybe Judaism only 
focuses on the existence of God without like Christian or Muslim faiths, which have very strict definitional models of what that God idea means. We do have some, because if you look at the prayer book and take it seriously, we are projecting ideology and theology about God in our prayer book. Let's go on. Is the people of Israel unique? I leave that as an open-ended question for your thought as you move forward from our study today, because I wonder whether people don't want to feel that uniqueness. You know, there's a lot of challenge about chosenness in Judaism, but let me say this to you out of my experience as a professor at the Catholic seminary and as a student of history. When the Torah talks about chosenness, it really says that we are a mamlechet kohanim v'goy kadosh. Our chosenness is to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That is our identity chosenness. When someone is called to the blessings for the Torah, it says, Asher bachar bano mikola amin benatan lano et Torah. We are chosen to have been given the Torah. That is our uniqueness. Now, what's ironic is that chosenness has been used and negatively represented in the way in which Christianity has created its own sense of centrality. Let me explain. This is the Kotak five-step understanding of early Christianity. This is what was projected. God chose the Jewish people. God gave the Jewish people Jesus. The Jewish people rejected, killed, whatever words you like, Jesus. God has rejected the Jews. Those who accept Jesus are the new covenant, the new Israel, the new chosen people. Chosenness became a negativity and a rejection of that which was before in the reinforcement of the concepts that Christianity chose. Judaism was over, finished, complete, and now there was the new covenant. So we, in many ways, have chosen to not appear to be different. Just go back to the Pittsburgh platform. We don't wear those garbs. We don't wear a talus. We don't have a kippah. We don't want to look different. We don't want to be unique. In fact, we don't even care about what we eat anymore because we want to look like everybody else. And we know the permutations of that through history, the changing of names, nose jobs, whatever you like. We have in some ways been uncomfortable what I would try and enforce in our thinking today is in freedom. And yes, there is a rise of anti Semitism. There is no doubt about that. But do you see yourself being unique? Not in an exclusionary way, but that being a Jew is an honor and a privilege and that you need to activate that in the way in which you see your responsibility and role in the world. Something to consider. Let's go on. Again, they're very committed and concerned about the role of Torah. So I wonder, how do you see your responsibility to integrate this idea into your life. Now, I know that many of you around this table go to Torah study as a way to gain greater knowledge from where you might have been as a child or as a young person or as an adult, that you are now looking at it in a serious way. And I encourage that and support it. The next, please. This is clearly at the core of all of this. 
what are our obligations? Our founders stress that Jews' ethical responsibilities, personal and social, are enjoined by God. Claims made upon us may begin with our ethical obligations, but they extend to many other aspects of Jewish life. This is a very clear statement that we don't end with good deeds. We only begin with good deeds. Reformed Jews are called upon to confront the claims of Jewish tradition, however differently perceived, and to exercise their individual autonomy, choosing and creating on the basis of commitment and knowledge. I would challenge this over acceptance of individual autonomy. I want to know where the boundaries of individual autonomy end and communal responsibility begin. Let me once again state, it's my appreciation of Jewish history that we were in a dual covenant relationship. We had an individual sense of covenant, but a communal sense and they balanced each other out. We have lived in the past 30 years, 40 years, through the over-empowerment of the individual, where this becomes the be-all and end-all of our behaviors, that it is our own autonomy that must be protected. Well, I believe that at some point we have to give up some of that autonomy for the sake of the whole. Too often, and I'm sure Rabbi Mates has found this, when we've tried to speak with congregants about issues of Jewish practice or history, and they will respond and say, well, that's your opinion. And I would say, no, it's really not my opinion. It's what 2,000, 3,000 years of Jewish thinking has evolved to. Now, you can reject it for sure. That's your choice. We have free will and choice but don't diminish it into just any other opinion that exists because it isn't. Let's go on. These are very strong statements about our connection to the state of Israel. I want you to be processing in your own minds in the weeks and days ahead, what is your relationship to the state of Israel? How did it get to be that? Has it changed? And please educate yourself in the dynamics of modern Israel and share it with your friends. Don't let them merely drop out of the Israel conversation because they don't like Israel's military position. Israel needs to defend itself and protect itself. One of the great challenges as an aside about what's going on with the Supreme Court is that we should be aware that the reputation of the Israeli Supreme Court in the world of jurisprudence is at the highest of esteem. In many ways, it has protected Israeli soldiers from being dragged into the International Court of Human Rights in The Hague, which is someplace where they bring people in, sometimes correctly and sometimes incorrectly. I don't see them having necessarily been as even-handed with Palestinians and their terrorist activities. Let's go on. Just some more positive statements about the state of Israel. Go on. This is now in a sense, the summary of what we've been looking at. Early reformed Jews newly admitted to general society and seeing in this the evidence of a growing universalism regularly spoke of Jewish purpose in terms of Jewries with humanity. In recent years, we have become freshly conscious and the values of particulars. I would Paint that on your wall. I would get a t-shirt that shows that distinction because that's the balance we need to reclaim. 
Until the recent past, our obligations to the Jewish people and to all humanity seem congruent. At times now, these two imperatives appear to be in conflict. I think it's important to both be aware of that and to think about where that changes your ideas and your perspectives. I think that might, is there another? Do we have more? Yes. Uh, no. I think that's it. Okay, so we're coming back to face each other. Now, having laid all this out, I'm wondering where you are gravitating to in this dialogue or concept and where you would want to go in the future to try and gain a perspective of what we are in 2023 and how you'd like to see that process take place. Any thoughts? Well, it's funny. I just was going to point out at the beginning when you said like, you know, people in a room make these things and they don't get to the consciousness of Reform Jew, but in this space, I don't know who's watching on you know YouTube and the live stream, but like Steve's wife was president of the region. Um, Robert Rabbi Reiner is a, a reform rabbi. You know, lived in Cincinnati. Um, you know, Margaret was we talked about grew up classical reform. So, but and even me as a rabbi and a product of the reform movement, I I don't I, I feel like this doc these documents are reacted to. Like I think congregants and most rabbis are not at the table when they are being formulated. Like, you know, Stephen Wise was Zionistic before the reform movement said, you know, it's okay now to be Zionistic. Right. Um, and I think there's like a big chasm between what they say and the impact on the Jewish community, because I think you're, the reform movement in terms of knowledge, you know, most like at other synagogues, like any congregate can read Torah, but not often in a reform setting. And so it's up to each individual rabbi to decide how much or little they convey of this document or the ideals exhibited. And so it's almost like an encouragement for a more knowledgeable reform community that both can read the Hebrew documents and the English documents and then figure out how to synthesize these things. Um, in their lives. It's also funny to be sitting at a place that's growing tremendously while a lot of the world, actually United States Jewry is not, I can't speak for world Jewry. And again, back to the beginning, this painful kind of divide that's going on in Israel. So in your opinion, like what's the, what should or could, or do you think is the impact of these documents on like us? Well, I think they're part of our inheritance and they certainly have influenced generations of rabbis to some degree in terms of how they were trained or how they grew up kind of in a subliminal way. My effort at present is how do congregants, people in the pew, and I'm part of the pew now, what are the messages that they're being given? Are they clear? Are they What's the word? Are they graspable in terms of what does it possibly mean to be a reformed Jew in 2023? And yes, Bethel is a unique and remarkable institution with wonderful rabbinic leadership and with great participation. But I'm always challenged by what do the people in the pew know? What do they think? What do they care about? Are they there because their friends are there? Are they there because they like the, the brownies at the Oneg? Are they there because they're seeking God? Are they there? I, I'm, I'm struck by all of that. And one of the things that I've always been challenged by is the concept that exists within certainly human relations, and that's mutuality. And mutuality exists and is important within a religious setting too. So as Rabbi Mates identifies the issue that there are people within the other pews of Judaism who themselves have much 
deeper background. Maybe it's in Hebrew. I don't know if it's in theology. But in those settings, there is an expectation that they have a role and responsibility in their engagement of the tradition. I'm concerned that in many reform congregations around the country, it's become, and I hate to use the term and I apologize in advance, performance Judaism, where it's a great show. And the people who come are entertained, but are not necessarily taking the responsibility. I've mentioned to you in the past that I always was concerned about the reinvention of prayer books in the reform movement, because the Hebrew always remained the same. What we changed were the readings around the Hebrew. And one of the challenges that people would speak to me about is, well, we think the, the, the language is much prettier in the new book. It's kind of stale in the old book. And I'd say, okay, but in a few years, it's going to become as stale and as commonplace as the old language was. Judy Kreditsky has her hand up, just so you yes, know. Yes, please, Judy. Judy, go, go ahead. ahead. You've got to unmute. You're muted. I'm going to ask you to mute. Okay. Um, I'm listening very closely to everything that we've learned. I mean, this is amazing stuff. But I've never felt anything but enormous support at Temple Bethel for Israel. There's, I've never experienced any dissent about what's going on right now. Maybe those discussions are happening, and I don't know that. But, uh, you know, as Margaret said last week with the Manashevitz uh, Haggadah, I agree 100%. We use it every year. Every year I start to write my own Haggadah but we always go back to the original with the wine stains and everything. Well, I, I really appreciate that because I'm glad, and part of the reason why Meryl and I are members at Bethel is because of what we feel concerning the state of Israel, but that's not the norm. There mm -hmm. are reform congregations around the country who have severed their relationship or speak negatively about the current state of Israel. And one of the things that Rabbi Levin and I are involved with is a conference that will take place in New York, May 31st and June 1st, which is called Recharging Reform Judaism, where we have been actively engaged in the past few years, struggling with what does it mean to be a reform Jew today? And that's what we're hoping to have dialogue and conversation and hopefully motivate that kind of engagement that I think we need in the current setting. Other thoughts around Margaret, uh, Margaret has her hand up. Go for it. Well, I agree with you. That I think the issue and why people are negative on Israel, I think there's an uncomfortableness. But the problem is they're not educated. And that, that's the thing. Listen, we, those of us in this class, we're all working in some way. We're trying to learn as much as we can. Uh, certainly my views have changed about a lot of things as I've grown in, in my education. And I believe that's... The, the key to all of this, people aren't educated. They just, they don't understand. I mean, they're not mean people. They're not, they just don't get it. They, I, they, I hear what you're saying. And at saying, one point- That's where I, we're lacking. We need to educate. I approached APAC to try and develop a training model for the 21st century on what Israel is and it never came to be. I'm going to try again. But we need to have some of that basic educational experience within our congregations because we make the assumption that people understand the state of Israel. And I don't think they do. And clearly, the 75th anniversary is a motivation to develop that kind 
of program. All right, kids, I think we're there, right? Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi. My so pleasure. fascinating. It's really to sit in a space that is ours, but reflect on it. Amazing. I appreciate your Thank help. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much.